Okay, welcome to another STAT 432 video. Um, we're not going to talk about machine learning in this class. Oh, <laughs> sorry. We're going to talk about machine learning in this class, just not this particular video. Um, instead, in this video, we're going to talk about how to think about using R. So sort of developing a mental process for when you're writing code. Um, I think this is sort of important because we're using R quite heavily to do machine learning. Um, and if you don't, have some of the um, R toolkit um, ready to use, it'll sort of limit your ability to write code um, to perform machine learning tasks. So we're gonna sort of take a step back and talk about some sort of um, general ideas for how to think about using R. Uh, but first, I actually wanna talk a little bit about computing. So um, I wanna put a period here for consistency. Um, Computers. Um, I think we often think that computers are smart. Um, I really hate that we call these things smartphones um, because that makes it sound like computers are smart. Um, computers are not smart. Computers are incredibly stupid. Um, I have no problem calling, uh, stupid is a mean thing to say, but um, last time I checked, uh, computers are inanimate objects, so I have no problem calling them stupid. And they are. Um, however, um, their stupidity is part of what makes them wonderful to work with. So for one, computers are strictly obedient. They do exactly what you tell them and nothing else. Sometimes it doesn't feel that way because it's a combination of what you, the user, and this other person, uh, some programmer, both are telling it simultaneously and there's ways that can go wrong and that's a bit what we're gonna talk about, but they, they follow the rules. Um, in particular, they love long, tedious sets of instructions. I mean, that's kind of how they work at every level, um, just abstracted away from us. Um, another thing that computers are great at is they have perfect memory. I mean, provided you don't have a hard drive failure, they remember everything perfectly. Um, I mean, there are ways this is not true. Everything I say in this video is only 99.5% correct, but, but in general, computers will remember what you tell them to remember. Great. Humans are not like that. Humans are very intelligent, or at least the most intelligent beings that we have found so far. Um, we love breaking the rules. There's not a rule out there that humans haven't tried to break and, and oftentimes broken for the betterment of society. So we love breaking rules. We love thinking outside the box. We love just bursting out of the box and living in a whole new world. We love that kind of thing. Um, we hate reading and following instructions. Um, I have plenty of evidence uh, of this from uh, writing syllabi and giving exams as an educator. I'm sure anyone who has ever had to build a piece of furniture from Ikea hated following the instructions. If you ever got a new electronic device, you took the instructions manual, you promptly threw it in the trash and be like, I'm just gonna figure this out. And that's great. That's part of what makes us human. Um, we also have terrible memories. I mean, relative to each other, some of us have better memories than others. But relative to a computer, we have terrible memories. I can't even remember what I ate for lunch yesterday, uh, m much less you know keeping a bunch of numbers stored in my head in the middle of a computation. So um, computers are not smart; they're stupid. Now, when when used together with a human, they are extremely powerful because they can do things that we can't. They can follow a long, tedious set of instructions that we give it. They can remember a bunch of stuff. Like I, I write myself notes all the time in a computer, but it goes much beyond that, right? Um, it can store lengthy files, video, images, um, and it's not just stored locally on my machine, it's stored locally on other people's machines that I have access to through the internet. I can recall almost any piece of information I want because I can just type it into my phone and get it. Um, sort of in that way, we are all cyborgs now uh, we don't have a chip implanted in our brain or anything, but we have a device with us pretty much all the time and we can interface with it. The problem right now is that the interface is just slow, but we are essentially augmenting our memory with these devices. We are augmenting, augmenting our ability to compute things with these devices. So, but, but I, I want to really key on this. Computers are not smart. They do what we tell them. So it's very important though that we understand what it is we're telling them. And that's what we're gonna talk about now. So in 
thinking about R more specifically, John Chambers here, who we're going to talk about, uh, he helped develop the S language, which was the predecessor to R and is now a member of what's called the R core team, uh, the folks who steer the direction of the R programming language. Um, and I like to call this the mental model for working with R. And I forget which text of his he wrote this in, but what he said was, to understand computations in R, two slogans are useful, helpful. I don't know, I should read verbatim, I guess. Everything that exists is an object. Everything that happens is a function call. So at face value, this seems very simple and like not much is being said, but, but it's actually very important. We could, we can sort of think about every line of code we write through this lens. And that's kind of what we're going to do in this video. Um, but so obviously we've been using functions left and right almost. And, and again, actually everything we did was through the use of a function. Sometimes that's a little unclear, but it's true. Um, and everything that exists is an object. Um, and that's kind of a vague statement. So it's like things that exist are things. Okay, great. Um, and we're not going to get down to like the machine level understanding of that, but I do want to talk about, well, what are the objects that we have seen, uh, in this class? There are many objects potentially in R and they all have very detailed, let's call it, uh, properties and way they, ways they work. I'm not going to get into that in this video. I'm probably going to talk about it more than I plan to because I can't help myself, but, um, I would recommend this book. Uh, it's called Advanced R, but I actually think it should be called something like uh, The Nitty Gritty Details of R, um, which are sometimes important. Uh, the author here, Hadley Wickham, probably better or best known as the uh, author of ggplot2, uh, but I particularly like this text. Um, it's linked inside of R text and there's a free version online. I just happen to have a dead tree version sitting around, so I like to use a visual aid here. Um, if you're interested in the nitty gritty details of all the possible objects and all their properties and the way they interact and the way you operate on them, here you go, have a look. But in 432, there are some object types uh, that we're gonna see sort of repeatedly. I would call those vectors, uh, technically atomic vectors, uh, lists, um, mostly through data frames or mostly tibbles, uh, and one other thing later, functions. Ooh, functions are objects, that's interesting. Uh, and something called model objects, which is kind of, I should put that in quotes because I'm kind of making that up uh, in a sort of a broad class of things, uh, but I'll explain that in a minute. Okay, cool. So let's think about these things a little bit. So this is some code we're gonna use later because I just don't want to write it. So thinking about vectors, okay, cool. So vectors are maybe the core object in R. Most of those other things we were talking about uh, either operate on or just a slightly different way of storing vectors. Um, so you've probably seen things like this. I'm going to create a vector called A, which stores, I don't know, some numbers, right? So this would be a vector of numeric values. Um, technically, there's integers and doubles, but we don't need to get into that. But the point is vectors, oh, that scroll bar, that's better. That might bother me later though. Anyway. I think it needs to be right there. Okay, uh, vectors, they have to store um, all the same data type. So that is a vector of um, numerics. I'm not gonna make the differentiation between integers and doubles, but for any of that kind of thing, there you go. Um, we can also store things like uh, character strings. So we can say like cat, dog cat. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, oh, if we wanted to do things like create um, a vector that contained a bunch of integers. So I'm using this C function. Oh, wait, what? Um, more on that later, uh, to create vectors, but there's many ways to create vectors, I could use uh, this syntax here to quickly create a vector of the integers from one to zero. Um, what did I say one to zero, one to 100? Um, note that there is no such thing as a scalar in R. This is actually a vector of length one. Uh, what these numbers here are, so this 20 here represents that, or this is the 20th uh, object in this larger vector. It's just sort of keeping track of the indexes for you. Um, something like that. Um, oh, we could store a bunch of logical, say true, false, true, um, something like that. 
I would note that something that we've done a lot in this class is do something like, okay, let's take this vector A that has a bunch of numerics in it, and let's say compare it to some other value five, and we get this nice output, which is comparing each individual object element to five and returning a vector of truth and false. I'm starting to use that function language. I'm saying return. Um, and, and this is sort of the idea of vectorization. So rather than say like looping through the vector, checking each value and storing true or false in a new vector, we just do this. Um, this is the idea of vectorization. Again, if you wanna know more about that, uh, and that's sort of a key to working in R. Um, if you ever find yourself writing a for loop, you should probably think to yourself, mm, this is okay, I'm not anti for loop, but there's probably a better way to do it. Okay, uh, the next thing we said was lists. Uh, and lists are one of these things where I think they're, they're not all that complicated, but sometimes we don't pause to sort of explain them well. So allow me to attempt it too quickly, but again, for the details. All right, I'll stop doing that, you get the point. Um, okay, so the point of a list and the, the thing that makes it different than a vector is so in a vector, I can't, oh, I should step back. So in a vector, I can't do something like this. So it, it just goes, mm, no, you can't have a number, a character and a logical all in the same vector. I'm going to coerce them all to be something that can go into a, uh, um, a vector together. In this case, it makes each element a character string. Uh, the rules around coercion would require me to like pull that book out and wave it in front of me. Um, but just know that coercion is happening there. So if instead of this, I try to make it, I don't know where that came from, a list instead, now it works. So now I can store a vector of length one containing the number one, a vector of length one containing the value cat sort of as a string, a vector of length one containing the logical true. Um, right, but it actually gets much more interesting than that. So, and, and, and these numbers here are perhaps confusing, but we'll try this now. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is instead of just, oh, let's back up, to, oh, sorry. Let's back, I'm saying way too much in this, there's way too much detail in this video, but I can't help myself. One thing about vectors that you may have noticed is that all of these vectors here, A, B, C, D, they don't have names for the elements. Well, you can name the elements of a vector. You can say the first element is one and it has a name A. Uh, the second element B is two and C is three, right? So these are the actual values of the vector, but these are some additional names associated with those. Um, I'm actually not sure if I know how to do this. I think then I could do something like extract this element through syntax like this. Haha, I did it, great, wonderful, grand. So sometimes you'll see these extra, extra. so where it gets really confusing is uh, something like this, um, that no longer works. But so if we did E1, so this is truly confusing, right? So it looks like there's two ones being output or it could even get worse, right? It could be something like this. That's confusing, right? So this is the name of the element. This is the actual element. Useful to know about. Okay, back to lists. So all that to say is that I'm going to now name the elements of my list. The first element, it's gonna be called A and it's gonna be a vector of length 10. Okay, uh, storing numbers. The second element is going to be a vector of length one, and it's just gonna be a character string, hello world. And the next element is gonna be a function. It's gonna be a built-in function called mean. Ah, you know, let's go a step further. Let's write our own function, store it as element D. Function x, let's say x squared. Silly function, but nonetheless, I can do it. And I'm gonna call this thing some list. Um, I have forgotten commas. Cool. Okay, so I have a list. It contains an element called A, which is a vector of length 10, where each element is a number. Uh, the list contains an element B, which is a vector of length one, which contains the character string, hello world. Uh, the, the list contains uh, an element C, which is the mean function that's built into R. It also contains an element D, which is a function that I just wrote within there. Okay, great. Um, 
Now let's access this list. Okay, so if I do something like this, uh, let's do one through two. So this returns a list with two elements, A and B. So the key thing with lists, and I think people overcomplicate this, is if you use single brackets, you're always gonna get a list returned. So where that's confusing is here, because while we as humans see mostly this vector, this is actually a list with an element A that is this vector. If I want that vector, there are two ways I can get at it. I can either use double square brackets, so that gets me the element that's stored in the first element of the list, or probably more useful is using the dollar sign syntax. So that, that returns not a list containing a vector, but a vector. Okay, cool. Um, so this, this might be a little goofy now, but so I could do something like this. So if I do this, that gives me back the function which is an object, because remember, everything is an object. But then I could also run it as a function and say, do something like, well, yeah, something like this. So that's the mean of the numbers one through uh, 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 100. I could do a similar thing. I could uh, extract that function that I wrote, which is an object. Or if I use the function syntax, uh, I could do something like this. And oh, look, it's vectorized, so it squared all the numbers one to 100. Super cool. Okay, so the more important thing is let's talk about data frames, data farms, uh, data frames. So what is a data frame? Uh, long story short, it's kind of a list, it is a list, but it's a list where each element is a vector and they all have the same length. There's a few other technicalities to it, but for practical purposes, that's what it is. So what I mean by that is, let's say we want to make a data frame. Uh, let's say we do this and then B. So they don't have to, I could do something like this, rep. Oh, here's another way of making a vector. Uh, hi, let's do this. Uh, so let's create a vector of length two. So, oh, sorry, let me get my bearings here. So if I run just this, this is a vector of length two, but then I want to repeat it uh, five times. So if I do something like this, cool. Um, and I'm going to do something silly, which is just uh, one through five. Okay, so this is a vector of length 10. This is a vector of length 10. This is a vector of length five. So you might say to yourself, Dave, you lied. You said everything has to be the same length. I did not lie. But I did not write my code correctly. Any comments? Really bad at that tonight. So the thing is, this was a vector of length 10. This is a vector of length 10. So what does R do when I give it this? It says, well, we're going to make that a vector of length 10 come higher, high, hell or high water. And it goes one through five, one through five. There you go. Um, which is cool, but sometimes dangerous if you get something like this. Oh, sorry, you can't do that. You can do that some places. Like I could do uh, one through three plus one through 10 with vectors. And that gives a warning. Oh, this is a good thing to talk about. I'm, I've gone off the deep end with our stuff, but this is important. And this has come up a lot in the class too. This is a warning, but my code ran. This is an error. That means my code did not run. So I'm not gonna belabor the point about what happened here. But basically, this is th length three, this is length 10, so you can't multiply this, uh, uh, an integer number of, you can't repeat this an integer number of times to make the length the same, and that's what it's complaining about here. This has probably come up in this class a few times, where if you like predict on the wrong data, you get a vector that's not the right length, and so on and so forth. But anyway, uh, so back to what I was saying here, I'm gonna now call this sum uh, data frame. And okay, so some data frame, we can operate on this as if it were a list. Um, so for example, I could pull out the element B. Cool. Uh, I could say, use this syntax, but now like a list, because I use single square brackets, it has to return a list. In this case, a data frame, but you get the point. So this gets me the vector. This gets me a data frame. Um, sort of similarly, if I did something like this, this would get me two columns of the data frame. But what it really is, it's elements two and three of the list that is the data frame. 
Um, okay, cool. Um, yeah, and then there's additional syntax here uh, because it's a data frame where you can do subsetting. So this, for example, would get me rows uh, two and three. That's unique to the data frame. I'm pretty sure this, you can't do that with a generic list. Yeah, that wouldn't, you, you couldn't, like that wouldn't work here, right? So um, yeah, that, does, that doesn't make sense, right? Um, okay, cool. So that's a bit about uh, data frames. Okay, um, functions. Functions are objects. Um, so I, I probably should have been pointing up here. Oh, that's not what, sorry, up here. My mouse shows twice. Uh, up here, um, all the objects that I'm working with have been stored here. And I'll look at that. Um, here we go. Uh, D is a function. Did I write a function? What's stored in D? I don't remember making that global. Anyway, uh, did I extract that? Okay, well, ignoring that. Um, right. Uh, and some objects like data frames and lists, you can you can dig into them a little bit like this. But what I was what I was gonna do is I was gonna write some function is a function. Uh, we won't even get any arguments, so we'll just say uh, print hello world. So it is now up here in our environment. It is an object. I can look at it. So that returns the function itself. But then if I do this, then it runs the function because now we're we're operating, not uh, looking at it. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, model objects. This is the tricky one. Okay, so basically, objects can have a class associated with them. Definitely not going to get into the details of that. I think this will be the last time I do this. But for our purposes, what I'm calling a model object is what is returned by running a modeling function. So for example, LM, right? So if I run LM and I just happen to know a data set we can use that's built in, that's not how you spell it though. Okay, uh, cars. Okay, cool. So two things, and this is actually jumping ahead on that list a little bit, and we've talked about this before. So sometimes what you see when you're running interactively is not actually what's returned by the function. Um, more on that in a second. But so um, this is just something that's printed when I run this function. It's kind of a side effect of the function. I kind of almost wish it didn't do it, but that's neither here than there. So I'm gonna call this some model, right? So what is returned here is actually, well, what does it show in my environments? Um, interesting, it calls it data. It's under this data heading and it's a list. Huh, that's interesting. And we'd actually check that. We say is.list. Oh, that's interesting. But it's a list with an extra attribute. And that attribute is its class. So the class of this thing is LM. So by and large, model objects in this class are going to be a list with a class of, you know, whatever the modeling procedure was. So what that means though, is that we can access parts of what was returned like a list. So for example, with the dollar sign operator. Uh, so if we want to see like the fitted values, there we go. And hey, look, that's a vector. Cool. Um, and, but then where this class comes in is where, okay, so now let's say I do predict um, mod. Uh, so that does a thing. It actually does the same thing that I just did there, coincidentally. But the important thing here is that the input to the predict function was a list, but it was a list with type class, uh, sorry, with, with class LM. So it's not the predict function that was run. It was actually the predict dot LM function. And well, you can see that those are the, those will do the same thing. Okay, cool. So if we had maybe fit K nearest neighbors instead, um, wait, wait, why don't we just do that? Um, da, da, da. So let's, uh, let's do this. I think it'd be K and N reg. We'll call this mod underscore K 
A and N. Cool. So let's look at this. Okay, so that doesn't really tell us much, but what if I do is, to, I don't, this might not be a list and I might look really silly here. Oh, it is. And what's its class? Oh, K and N reg. So when I call predict on mod underscore K and N, that actually doesn't work. Oh, this will be a great segue. So the, the problem is, is that it's not running predict. It's running predict dot, uh, actually, let me verify this. K and N reg, is that a function? Huh. Uh, da, 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 da. Sorry. Could not fun find function. I'm oh sorry. Um, I'm gonna stop looking at this environment so much, and we're gonna start looking at help documents because that is what's gonna become important now. Okay, so. What's the deal here? Um, okay, I guess I can't access it directly, but when I run predict dot, uh, predict, sorry, canon mod reg, what's actually running is um, this predict.knn reg function. And it turns out that you have to supply the new data. So when I run this, it doesn't work. But if I then say uh, new data is cars, then it does work. Okay, cool. Maybe not the best illustration, but it does show you that. Um, and that's because this predict function is different than this predict function. Because here, new data is optional. Uh, here, it doesn't say that um, without getting into the details. Okay, cool. So um, I want to sort of talk a little bit about this now. Everything that happens is a function call, and I want to think about functions. So functions take multiple inputs and then output a, sim a single thing. If we sort of are talking about the generic mathematical idea of a function. Um, but in R, is this true? I'm pretty sure this is true. This has to be true because everything is an object. The inputs to the function, that is the inputs to the, like, the arguments of the function, those are all objects. And then the output is an object. So that's really nice. But so, and this is gonna be where we get into some tedium here. I believe that every line of code that you write, you should think to yourself, what is the function that I'm running? What does that function want the objects to be that I'm passing it? That is, does it want a vector? Does it want a list? Does it want a function? Does it want a model object? Does it want a data frame? Are there restrictions beyond that? What does it expect the input to be? And then most importantly, you should ask yourself, what do I want to accomplish by running this function? And you should answer that question in two ways in the context of the machine learning that you're trying to do, but also in the R object terminology, like what object do you want to come out? Is it a vector, a list, a data frame, a function, a model object? If it's a vector, what are the dimensions of it? If it's a data frame, what are the dimensions of it? If it's a list, what are the elements contained in it? Because it's really hard to know if code is doing what you want it to do. If you don't first ask yourself, well, wait, what do I want this code to do? So let me try to do that. And this maybe won't be the most fun exercise. Okay, but we're gonna come back up here to this code that I ran. Um, maybe we'll talk about this code a little bit actually um, with the, those statements in mind. So I'm actually gonna ignore set seed because what I just said about it returning an object is a little bit untrue, but this is a function, so that's cool. Okay, so first I'm gonna test train split the data. And to do that, I'm gonna run the sample function. Uh, this one in particular. Okay, cool. Oh, I have a scroll bar. Let's just do this. Okay. Sorry, I'm really, I wanted 80 character length. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay, so sample. Okay, so what does a sample function do? Okay, so here's a little bit about it. So here are the names of the arguments. The X argument 
either a vector of one or more elements from which to choose or a positive integer. Okay, so the first argument of the function needs to be a vector. Is this a vector? Oh, of course it's not because <laughs> I didn't give myself the right code. Okay, uh, Palmer penguins. And then I think uh, the data set is called penguins. Um, and I think what I did is I did na omit. <laughs> Silly me. Okay, sorry, we could talk about that, but I'm gonna skip that for now. Okay, so penguin is a data frame. So the first argument to sample needs to be a vector. So oh, or a positive integer. So I'm doing a positive integer. And then internally, it's going to do this. So that was maybe a bad example, but it's also a good example because it shows there's a lot going on here. OK, uh, but n row, n row is also a function. N row, OK. Uh, n row and n column return the number of rows or columns present in x column, blah, blah, blah. So what is x? The imp what is the input to the n row function? Well, it's either a vector, array, or data frame. Cool. We inserted a data frame. The value is what, re what gets returned. An integer of length 1 or null. Cool. That's what happened. Great. So we better understand that. Um, so this sample returns a vector. Uh, we should probably... What is it? What is its value? Uh, okay, this is gonna be a little bit complicated. For a... For sample, a vector of length, size, with elements drawn from either x, blah, blah, blah. So in particular, it tells us it returns a vector of a particular size. And hey, look, that's what we have here. Cool. Um, I would note that... So this is... This is an example of everything that happens is a function call. Um, this is a super specific point. So is this assignment because believe it or not, I think I have to do quotes here. Equals is, it's a, it's a function and it takes inputs and it outputs something. That's a little hard to wrap your head around sometimes, but it's a function. Okay, cool. Um, this is, remember, a data frame. So this is the data frame subsetting we saw from earlier. Okay, great. So I'm going to run all this and just move on. But we're starting to think about this. Okay, so let's say I want to do something really simple, right? So I guess I should look at the data real quick. Um, let's look at the estimation data. So let's say I want to predict the species given bill length and flipper length, I guess, something like that, right? Okay, cool. So I want to do that. I want to do it using, let's say, a decision tree. So let's load that up real quick. And then I want to do something super simple, like calculate the accuracy of, of that model, right? Like the, let's say the validation accuracy, just to be specific, right? Um, cool. Let's do that. Okay, great. Um, I would note that this sort of also breaks um, this a little bit um, because our part is not an ob oh it is an object oh that's because I loaded it though but technically you would need quotes here so then this is a vector of length one and that's a function being applied to that but there's something going on there when you have the quotes where it still works but that's confusing to beginners I'm still confused by that anyway what did I say I was going to do I was going to fit a tree model with species as the um, response and uh, I should just do something like this. Um, this variable and maybe this variable, I think that's millimeters and to the estimation data, right? So I know that we just ran a function. Um, so why don't we have a look at that documentation real quick just to make sure we understand the inputs and the outputs, right? So the inputs, uh, a formula, so this here is what we call a formula in R. Um, we're not going to get into the details of that right now. Um, and then also data, an optional data frame. Well, this was definitely a data frame because tibbles are also data frames. Great. Uh, and then if we scroll down, value, an object of class, R part. Let's verify that. 
So what is the class of model? It's our part. Um, I have a sneaking suspicion though that it's also a list. Okay, cool. Okay, next step. Um, hmm. Not next step. So now what I'm gonna do, this is gonna be the, the example that I drive this point home with, I guess. This is a really, this is a really long winded video just to make one really minor point, but I think it's super important. I'm now gonna go on autopilot and I'm going to attempt to calculate the accuracy from here. And frankly, it's only like two, I could do it in one line of code. Um, but I wanna show that if I, if I even don't check what happens with just one line of that code, I'm gonna get in trouble. Here we go. So I wanna take my model and make a prediction with it. Um, and then I'm gonna store that as preds. And then it's, okay, first of all, I said validation and I didn't even name it right. Okay, uh, this, cool. So then what I wanna do is I wanna calculate the accuracy. So I'm gonna compare the predictions to the true species values. Uh, and then we'll take the mean of those. Yeah, and that's, that's how you calculate accuracy, right? Huh. 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 This is either a really bad model or I did something wrong. I did something wrong. What did I do wrong? I didn't do the thing I said to do here. We're running a function. Okay, cool. What am I, so what am I trying to do with this function from a machine learning perspective, I want to acquire the classifications for this data, that is which species based on the feature values of this data using this model. Okay, so what does my function take as input? Well, I definitely need to give it the model. I definitely need to give it the data. Okay, I've done that. I've stated my expectation. So I expect this to be a vector with like the different species names, right? And, it, and maybe it'll even be a factor too. And that's, we kind of breezed by that, but let's see what happens. Oh, oh, this isn't that because we didn't check it. And I don't know how you compare this to this. So what did we do wrong? Well, we could say to ourselves, well, Dave, you just need to add type equals prob there, or sorry, type equals class, to which I say, you're right, but I didn't need to know that. All I needed to do was run this, realize this function doesn't do what I think it does. So what I should do is run uh, predict dot r part. Okay, object, uh, fitted model object of class r part, we did that, new data, which we did not name for reasons we've talked about. Uh, data frame containing values of which predictions are required. Cool, we're gonna do that. Type, oh, what does type do? Character string denoting the type of predicted value. If the R part object is a classification tree, the default is to return prob predictions, a matrix, not a vector, whose columns are the probability of the first, second class, blah, blah, blah. Otherwise, a vector result is returned. Um, and we could read, okay, so what we actually want is type class for classification, a factor of classifications based on the responses. Aha, so this value again talks about the output. And it, obviously there's a lot going on here and I sort of knew to look here, but so bottom line, what I need to do is say type equals class. Okay, so now I run it, that's what I want. So now I store it, now I run it. That looks like something I'm after, okay. So I only ran a few lines of code and it took me forever to do it. I mean, kind of because I'm explaining myself, I cannot believe this is about to be a 40 minute video. But so my whole thing is I'm gonna have to read, I'm gonna have to do another video because the point I'm making is that 40 minutes into this video is I think when you're writing code, you should be doing this. Identify the function that you're running and I mean, sometimes it's not explicitly running a function. Like if we look, if we look here, right, 
So does this look like we're running a function? No, technically internally, there's like a subset function being running and, and, and you should be able to say, well, this is a data frame. This is how you subset a data frame. So it should give me back another data frame and we could run that and that's what happens. But more importantly, when we're doing things like running a function, maybe this is even a better example, you should say to yourself, um, okay, what are the inputs of the function, both from a machine learning perspective and from an R object perspective? That is, what are the types of objects that the function expects? They're often listed in the um, documentation. Um, and then what do I expect to get out of that function, both from a machine learning perspective, but then also from an R object perspective? Do I want a vector, a list, a data frame? If so, what are the dimensions that I'm expecting? and then run the function and check it, see if it did what you want, then run the next line of code. Most of the code we're writing in this class is so short that you can always do that. And then it's probably a good idea to, to go back and run the code from start to finish, just to make sure you haven't accidentally run two lines of code um, out of order or anything. Yeah, and so, you know, I, I guess, you know, hopefully this, this tells you a little bit about what you're looking for in the documentation. So, so generally the way the documentation lay, is laid out is roughly this. So um, it tells you the package that the function is from. Uh, it gives you a brief overall description of what it, the function is doing. It gives you an example of usage. Um, that is, it tells you the function name and then what the call looks like. And in particular, it shows you all of the argument names that you can pass to the function. That is the names of the inputs of the function. And it'll often show you some of them, what their default values are. So then the argument section will detailed, give a detailed description of what those arguments are gonna be. So for formula, that should be an object of class formula. Um, uh, there's a lot going on there. Uh, data, it should be a data frame. Uh, subset would be a vector. So you could give it a, a, a vector and it would basically be saying, we'll only use these rows of the data frame. But I, I'm just highlighting the keys here. Weights, vector, NA action, function. Notice all of these are referencing those object types we talk about. Uh, method, uh, these are technically character strings, but they're not saying it explicitly. Um, these things all want logicals. Uh, contrast, an optional list. Um, okay, cool. The details section then sort of generally tells you, okay, here's what's happening in the function sort of in like English, like human to human com uh, conversation. Uh, and then often there is the value, which is telling you, okay, here's what is gonna be the return of this function. Um, so this one says it very nicely, returns an object of class LM, uh, which we saw as also a list. Um, and then it sort of describes the objects of that list. Uh, sorry, oh yeah, an object of class LM is a list containing at least the following elements. Okay, great. This is, this is a really great documentation. Um, and then it says a bunch of other stuff and then often gives an example at the end. Um, so yeah, am I saying you have to read the documentation for every time you, you, you run a function? No, but you'll start to get, uh, you know, some of these things memorized. I don't really like saying memorized, but you'll get a feel for some of them. But if there's ever an error in your code, these are the steps you need to take to try to fix it. Um, but what I'm saying is if you just um, sort of proactively take some of these steps, you're going to have to fix uh, a lot less code. <sighs> okay, I rambled way too long. Um, but hopefully that gives you some things to think about when you're using R. Um, hopefully uh, you'll take something away from that where you can find a moment when you're writing R code and be like, oh, wait, no, I need to think about inputs. I need to think about outputs. I need to think about what are the objects that I have? What are the objects that I want? Um, okay. Whew. 45 minute video, just because I wanted to talk about one little quotation. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, as always, if you made it to the end of the video, good job. And I'll see you in the next one.